All right, this is the pivot lab of making measurements and sig figs. So we're going to start out here by reviewing some sig figs. So they're going to ask you some basic questions of how many sig figs are in a given number. You're going to review your rules on zeros and what that does to our sig figs. And you're going to answer some questions. So you're going to start out with just how many sig figs are in a number. And then after you've gone through those, the key is how to use it in multiplication and division, remembering that the answer has the same number of sig figs as the measurement with the fewest. And then we're going to look at addition and subtraction, which is remember when we look at that, is the answer has the fewest number of digits past the decimal as the term with the fewest rather than the fewest number of sig figs. So if we did the math on this question right here, question 10, because 10.1 has one digit past the decimal, that point 0.1, your answer is going to have one digit past the decimal. So make sure you review your sig fig rules before you go. And then what you're going to do is we're going to take and apply our sig fig rules to measurements. And we're also going to make measurements. So when we do this, we remember that when we make a measurement, we include every digit we're certain of and the first one that is estimated. So in the case here of this 80, because it is sitting right at 80, and we're going to read from the bottom of the meniscus, which is sitting right exactly or what appears to be exactly at the 80 mark, we are going to know that our value for our measurement here is we know it's 80 and we're on that zero so that we have every digit we're sure of, which is 80, and the first one that is estimated, which is the zero, and we're going to look at our units on this one, which is milliliters, and you're going to take and you're going to click on your answer here as 80.0, every digit you're sure of and the first one you estimate, you're going to submit your answers here. And when you've done that, it's going to tell you if you're right or wrong. If it's wrong, obviously, you need to correct it. When you look at a mass measurement, the last digit on the balance is inherently the estimated digit. So when we included the mass for this one, we would include all of the digits, the 166.6. .6, all those digits are significant. So we're going to go ahead and do that part there. Density is mass over volume, and you're going to do some math here. And then we're going to do go and we're going to measure the density of a substance. And from this, we are going to take and we're going to get the identity of the substance or approximate it from its density. So to do this, we have to make some measurements. So I'm going to start out here with liquid number one. And I'm going to start at the beginning on liquid number one. And I'm going to go to the very beginning of it. If you go to the far right hand side here, this expands your screen. Um, when you do that, it makes it much easier to take and do your measurements. So I'm going to press the play down here at the bottom, which I don't think you can see, and we're going to make some measurements. So the first thing we're going to realize is that we're taking and we're weighing the graduated cylinder. So record that mass of 96.4, and then we're going to add some liquid. Now, as we add the liquid, it's going to have a few bubbles in it. And so we're going to wait a few moments for the bubbles to settle, and then we're going to record the mass and read the volume. Now, when we do this, we're going to wait until just before they start to add more liquid. And you can see that with the um, Erlenmeyer flask here being poured into the graduated cylinder at the top. And we're going to record the volume. So I'm going to record here that my volume is 22.0 milliliters. Read here at the bottom of the meniscus. You could put 22.1 um, milliliters if that's what you see. Record what it is you see. I'm going to record the total mass here of 124.1 grams and realizing that I had that 96.4 grams for the mass of the empty Erlenmeyer flask. And I'm going to do two points here to show you how we would graph it. So they're going to add some more liquid. They're going to give it a second for the liquid to settle. And I'm going to record the volume again just before they start adding more liquid. And I can see that by the Erlenmeyer here at the top. Um, like you, I probably just missed it. So we're going to try that one again. And as I do this, I have a volume or a mass here of 141.3 as the mass of the liquid on there and a volume of 36. I'm going to go 36.0. I like that 36.0 milliliters equally 35.9 something in there and that is going to be the volume and the total mass when you get to trial number two which you're going to be doing as well when you go to trial number two 
you're going to come here and click on the change, go to liquid number two, you're going to load which put the video in, you're going to hit the play button, and note this is a completely different liquid. They've put water in it because if they don't, the liquid kind of sticks to the sides and the volume doesn't work. Water will have no effect on the actual results of the experiment. You're just going to read the volume of the silver liquid as you add it. So they're going to pour the silver liquid in. And when they do that, you're going to record the change in the, the total mass. You're going to get the change in the mass and you're going to record the volume of the silver liquid. Again, reading in this case from the top of the silver line rather than from the bottom of the meniscus. So what are we going to do with all this? Well, I'm going to start with trial number one. That was the first liquid. I'm going to put the volume in that I measured, which was 22.0. I'm going to put the total mass of um, 124.1 grams. For my second one, I had a volume of 35.9 and a total mass here of 141.3. Now, Pivot does some really nice things for you. One of the things it does is it will actually calculate um, values within a column. So with a quick note, if you ever need to add more rows, you can click right down here and add a row. If you ever need to add more columns, you can click over here on the three dots and you can add more columns. If you want to change the name of a column, you can go over here and you can just type in and change the name. Um, you can add, change its sig figs. You can do all sorts of things. But what I'm going to do is go over to the third column where it says the fluid mass, and I'm going to do some math. Now, to do this, I'm going to go to change column formula. And when I look at this, what I want for my change column formula is I want the total mass, which is what I measured, minus the mass of the graduated cylinder. So to do that, I'm going to click on this little negative here. That's going to be subtract. I'm going to click in the number, and I have to just click it in here on the calculator. The empty graduated cylinder weighed 96.4 grams. So I'm going to click that in, and I'm going to click on submit. Now, if I make an error, I just click on this C button, and that will just clear everything. And you can do all sorts of different math here. So if I click on the submit, I'm going to get the mass of the fluid in this liquid. Now when I do, or fluid, um, the mass of this fluid in this experiment. So what do we do from this? Well, from here we want to graph it. So we're going to go down to our next option and we're going to graph. Now obviously I only have two points, so I'm going to get a nice straight line. But what we want to do on this one is we want to graph the volume on the horizontal axis and the mass on the vertical axis. So how do you do this? Well, to graph or to pick which column do you want to graph, all you need to do is click on the axis themselves. So if I want the volume on the horizontal axis, I will simply click on that. I will put configure horizontal axis and I will select which one I want to graph and I'm picking the volume. Um, do zero uncertainty. The uncertainty is a little confusing at this stage. If I want to go to this one, I have total mass selected. I don't want total mass selected. I, in fact, want the fluid mass selected. So I'm going to change that. I want no uncertainty. And I'm going to click on the mass of the fluid selected. And you go, OK, fantastic. Yours won't be a perfect straight line because you're going to have more points. But what I really want out of this is the density. We know the density is the mass over the volume, which is going to be the slope of this line. So if I click over here on this little cog, our little um, settings button, I can hit curve fit, which will put a best fit or a trend line in here. I'm going to select linear because it's going to be a linear fit, and I'm going to click done. And when I do that, it is going to give me a lot of information down here. So if I look at this, I realize that my line, instead of saying y equals mx plus b, they choose y equals ax plus b, where a here is the same as m, and it is the slope. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the density of this liquid is 1.24 grams per mil from my simple two data points. Now yours may not be exactly the same because obviously you're going to have a lot more data points than I am. So what are you going to do with this? Well, you're going to figure out the density for both of your liquids from these graphs. 
So you're going to take and collect the data. You're going to find there's going to be five separate data points, hopefully on both of them. You're going to um, plot your data, put them into the um, data table here. You're going to come down and you're going to graph them. And after you have graphed them, you're going to take and you're going to tell us what is the identity of the two liquids. So do both trials and then submit it when you're done. And when you're done and you submit answer, there really is no submit button on the end. It will just take and automatically submit your results.